morning, Grace Family Church. How are we this morning? There we go. Okay, we're going to start ourselves off with some singing, so won't you stand to your feet? We're going to welcome all those watching online around the world. It's great to be together. And let's lift our voices as Kadia leads us in this time of worship. Let's join our voices.
let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing. Sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. So this morning as we sing our hearts out to Him, why don't we invite the Holy Spirit, who's already present in this place, to move in our actions, to move in our thoughts and our words, to move in every part of our lives. Because the Bible describes Him as the comforter, the counsellor, the friend, and so much more. But let's ask Him to work in our lives today. Shall we do that?
that your presence is in his every moment. Let us become more aware. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would change our hearts, that you would change our thought patterns, that you would change our words, that you would change our actions to be more like Jesus. Have your way in us, God, we pray. In the name that is above every other name, we pray. The incredible name of Jesus. And together we said, Amen. Why don't you take your seats? Amen. Wasn't that fantastic? Just a time to gather and to worship. It's so great to be together. And if you're new, if you're visiting with us, we just want to say welcome. Hope that you feel at home here at Grace. And we say come as you are. And hopefully you've come this morning. And you're going to be touched by God in a very real and tangible way. Amen. Why don't you turn to someone and say, how's it? There we go. We're going to continue in an attitude of worship, and this is just another way that we get to express our worship uh, through tithes and offerings. Uh, we, you can go ahead and get ready for that as the volunteers prepare to hand out the baskets. I know many of you give in other ways, give online, give regularly through EFT and that sort of stuff, but this really is a, an act of worship that we get to do every week and participate in. Just as we've sung songs, just as we read in that Colossian scripture, that worship is, is more than singing, it's, it's words, it's actions, it's every part of our lives as we offer it to God for His glory. And so we make this offering uh, as we seek to follow Jesus. And Jesus gave. That's what He did. He gave Himself. And so we respond to His generosity by giving as well. So just before the, the volunteers hand out the baskets, let me bow, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we thank You that we get to give. We thank You for, first and foremost, Your incredible generosity towards us, that You so loved the world that you gave your only son and that you continue to give to us and bless us in so many ways. And so help us to respond to your generosity with generosity. Help us to steward the resources that are gathered here this morning and that we can use them to really further your kingdom, not our kingdom, not Grace Family Church's kingdom, your kingdom here on earth. We ask this thing in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. While the baskets are going around, just to point your attention, do we have a baby dedication taking place today after our 1055 service? And those are some of the kids that are being dedicated this morning. So we just want to alert you to that and just remind you of that because we gather with the families after the service and they get to read out letters and pray for the kids. And we love family. We love kids. And so we just want to celebrate with those who are being dedicated today. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Sam. She's going to tell you more about what's coming up in the life of the church. So take a look at the screens. Hello everyone, I'm Sam and we are looking at what's coming up here at Grace. If you are new here today, welcome. Please join us in the Glass Lounge straight after the service for Engage One. We want to meet you and answer questions you may have about Grace. If you are on graceonline.tv, please connect with anyone on the stream tagged as a host. We can't wait to meet you. We are launching a barista team for Sunday morning services and Wednesday night grow nights. Great coffee is a big deal here at Grace because coffee shops are the modern day well. It's where we all gather and connect. If you are keen to be trained as a barista and be part of serving great coffee here at Grace, please sign up after the service. Grow Nights is where we learn, connect and grow. Term 3 has started with loads of courses and events every Wednesday night. Food is on sale from 6 p.m. and there is childcare for under 12s. Remember, there are also small groups that meet during the week. Collect a detailed Grow Night brochure at the info desk to find out more. Well, that's it from me. Everything you've heard is in your brochure and on our social media platforms. Catch up on sermons you may have missed on graceonline.tv. But for now, enjoy the rest of familyhood.
There we go. So lots of exciting things coming up in the life of Grace. So make sure you kind of get connected to the things happening here. Uh, but as I said, good morning. Um, it really is great for me to be here this morning. I'm excited to be here at Amschlange. I haven't preached here in a long, long while. Um, I think you see more of my wife here in the morning, but I'm excited. I'm excited for this series. Uh, if you don't know who I am, <laughs> I've been away so long. My name is Tom. I'm a campus pastor at Riverside, but I'm part of the preaching team. And, and we're starting a series today, which I'm really pumped about. It's called Familyhood. And I really believe that this series and the message that God has put in my heart for this morning, I believe it has the potential to change some things in your life, to shift some things in your heart, to do something in your relationships. Because we're not just talking about mom, dad, and two kids and family. We're talking about all of our relationships across the board. And I think all of us have relational tensions somewhere in our life that we're facing. And so my heart and my prayer is that, that this message, this series would change, would change your marriage would change how you parent, would change how you relate to your parents, perhaps. I really believe that God wants to speak into your life this morning. So are you ready to hear from God? The nice lady at the back there is very ready, so that's good. Thank you. Okay, let's pray. Father God, you know good and well that I don't know what each person here needs to hear today, what they're facing today, but Lord, I know that you know what's going on in our hearts. You know what we need to hear. And so I pray that you'd use my words somehow to speak your words into our hearts. Amen. Amen. So I wanna talk about, as we kick off this series, I wanna talk about the topic of kindness, of kindness, of the power of kindness and the impact that it can have on all of our relationships. I also wanna talk about how kindness kills and if that sounds like a contradiction, hold on, hang on, because hopefully it will kind of make sense in the end. But I want to start by asking, has anyone uh, ever been kind to you? Think of a moment where someone's been kind to you for no reason, when they didn't have to be. Maybe you dropped your wallet somewhere and you left it somewhere and someone picked it up and you know, they could have taken it, uh, or, you know, but they went through the hassle of getting hold of you. Uh, maybe you messed up at work and you were kind of expecting to be rebuked, you know, get called into the boss's office and she's just going to chastise you. And instead, they were, you know, she was just kind to you. See, I, you, she, oh, you see, inclusive. Anyway, um, <laughs> think about a moment where someone's been kind to you for no reason. Uh, as you think about that, a story that pops into my mind uh, immediately is a story that when Jess and I were traveling, this was before we had kids, and we were traveling uh, between Bolivia and Argentina in South America. And we had to catch one bus to the border and then quickly change at the border. Uh, we had to get across the border post, get new currency, and then get another bus. and It'll take us another eight hours to where we were heading in Argentina. So we knew that things were going to be a bit crazy. We couldn't speak the language that well. And um, it was the, the Bolivian bus, as it turns out, was running very late, which is what Bolivian buses do, by the way. Um, and so we knew when we got there, we were going to have to hustle. And we were on one of those double-decker buses. We were, we, I remember we were watching like Rocky IV in Spanish. It was awesome. And when we, but when we got there, we had to get off and go. So I kind of uh, jumped down the stairs. It was one of those double-decker buses. And I started getting the bags out from underneath the bus when I heard this sort of almighty like, boom, 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 boom. and what had happened, I turned around, and Jess had actually done like a, like a gymnastic somersault dismount down the stairs and landed on her back on the street. And it was kind of like one of those funny, not funny moments. Um, I thought it was funny. <laughs> I started laughing. And then I saw her face. She didn't think it was funny. And then I stopped thinking it was funny very quickly. Um, so anyway, we, now I, I, she's actually really hurt. She's actually bleeding. But we have to run. We were late. We, I grab the bags. We run. We get across the border post. And we're now gapping it to the next bus just in time. We get there just as the bus is leaving. And as we get onto the bus, now we've got no money, no currency. We haven't eaten for hours, and we know we've got a long bus drive ahead. And so the kind of shock of the whole thing, and I think the fall and everything, it just sort of you know, hit us there, and Jess began to cry. And she was quite upset, and we were sitting in the bus. But I'll, I'll never forget what happened next. As we were sitting there, this, this really kind man, this Argentinian man, he, 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 didn't, you know, he couldn't speak a word of English, and he came to us, and he just was so kind to us. He was patting Jess on the back. He was really trying to help her, and, and he realized then, then we didn't have any food, we didn't have any money, and so he opened up his backpack, and he be began to give us his lunch, his food that he'd made for himself, and we were just so blown away by his generosity, and then he actually opened his wallet and started giving us like Argentinian currency, and we were like, no, 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 but he insisted, and this was not a rich man, you know. And he just showed us an incredible sense of grace. And, 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 and 
you know, as I remember that story, the thing that stands out is not the panic and the rush and the gymnastics dismount. Really what stays with me is the kindness of that random Argentinian man. And I, I think it will stay with us for the rest of our lives. That's the thing about kindness. It's shown in small ways, but it makes big waves. Yes? I wrote that down. I thought that was brilliant, but anyway, I thought I was going to get a better... Maybe you didn't hear it. Um, it's shown in small ways, but it makes big waves. There we go. Okay. Mother Teresa says, says this, Kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. Mark Twain says, Kindness is a language that the deaf can hear and the blind can see. We, didn't, we couldn't speak the same language as that man, but we understood him perfectly because he was speaking the language of kindness. It's a universal language. There's a beautiful story in the Bible that for me highlights the power of kindness and the ability that it has to transform our lives. It's a story that maybe you haven't heard before, but as I said, I think it's a story that has the potential and the power to change how we do our relationships going forward. It's a story about King David and a guy by the name of Mephibosheth. How's that? And you know how hard that is to say when you have a lisp like me? I've um, been practicing all week. But I put his name on the screen so you know I'm not lying. This is a guy's real name. Um, if you're pregnant, you're looking for baby names, you're welcome. Okay. Mephibosheth. So in this story, King David, in a kind of stunning twist, he expresses one of the most beautiful acts of kindness towards this outcast, Mephibosheth. And just for some context, what's happening is for years, uh, the, the kind of crazy lunatic king, King Saul, has, has obsessively hunted David down like big game. He was threatened by David. He, he was jealous of David. And so he hunts him down, tries to have him killed. But now that Saul and his son, Jonathan, who was a friend of David, now that they were, were dead, they'd been killed in battle, David had been crowned king of Israel, just as the prophet Samuel had predicted many years before. So David sits on the throne, but now you have to understand the context. In that day and age, it was common practice to exterminate all members of the previous dynasty, all members of, of any family that would threaten your throne. As long as a spark of life from that old royal family still smoldered, it was considered a threat to the king. Kind of like Game of Thrones, okay? How many of you watch Game of Thrones? You're too embarrassed to admit it in church. Okay, um, you know, kill all the threats to your throne. And yet David's response was quite the contrary. He asks in verse three of, of 2 Samuel 9, he says, is there anyone remaining from Saul's family that I can show kindness to because of Jonathan? I mean, this is a stunning move of grace. Firstly, because it wasn't an easy task to find the remaining blood of Saul's family, and yet David sets out to do it. He gets Ziba to go find uh, this person. He finds Mephibosheth. And we first learn about Mephibosheth a few chapters before in 2 Samuel 4. And I want to just read to you so you understand his context. It says, a Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son named Mephibosheth. So he's Saul's grandson, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. And when the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him and he became crippled. And so this is many years later, he's a crippled man, he's living in obscurity in a barren kind of remote corner of the kingdom, um, and he gets summoned to come before the king. Now, he's thinking, okay, I've been found, the king has found me, and now I'm just, I'm going to be put to death because my father's, you know, my grandfather's saw and Saul did terrible things to David. But that's not how the story plays out. Picking up in verse 5, it says, when he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. I mean, this is a stunning kind of twist in the tale. Not only, I mean, David was offering him an inheritance, an inheritance beyond his wildest dreams. But not only that, to eat at the king's table was not a temporary honor. 
it, it meant that he would have a pension from the king for the rest of his life. He would eat at the king's table always. And this is crazy. I mean, he was expecting a sword to sever his head, and now he's been given an inheritance beyond his imagination. And David's words were not just kind of a token gesture. They were extravagant. His was a demonstration of love toward a man who didn't deserve it, who could never earn it, and would never be able to repay it. David, the strong and famous king, reached out to Mephibosheth, the cripple, the outcast, and expressed kindness to him like he'd never known before. I, I, listen to his response. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Now, the fact that Mephibosheth refers to himself as a dead dog gives us some insight to how he saw himself. This, he was referring to the most foulest, nastiest thing that he could possibly think of. For a Jew, it was a double kind of whammy. To them, a dog was the most repulsive animal uh, on the planet. And on top of that, anything dead was considered vile and unclean. So he thought of himself as a, as a pile of garbage, a man of shame. And perhaps as he lay prostrate there before the king, in his moment of greatest vulnerability, perhaps the name calling of a lifetime came flooding back to him. Maybe he heard again the humiliating taunts of those who found him worthless and despised his entire life. Crippled, outcast, dead dog, man of shame. And yet David never spoke such words. Instead, in 2 Samuel 9 verse 4, I mean, this is amazing. Referring to Mephibosheth, he says, where is the son? Where is the son? And I wonder how long it had been since Mephibosheth had been called a son, a son of the king. You see, words have a way of changing us, don't they? Words have a powerful way of bringing healing and restoration. A kind word can, can literally change the trajectory of our lives, put us on an esteemed path. Whoever said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me, well, they lied. Because words, man, unkind words can cause huge damage, massive destruction in our marriages, in our relationships, and perhaps you know this all too well. Perhaps it was the words of a teacher or a parent who said, you'll never be good enough. You'll never make it. Maybe a spouse or a partner. Words can wound and wound deep. But kind words, kind words can bring life. They can bring restoration. They can lead us to wholeness. They can change our, the trajectory of our lives. And I suspect the words that David spoke to Mephibosheth that day literally changed his life forever. This is the power of kindness. Henry James says, three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. Kindness, it's such a, it's not a small thing. It's a, it's a powerful, powerful habit that we can build into our lives. Colossians 3 uh, verses 12 to 13, Paul writes this. He says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, that's you and me, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Paul says, clothe yourself in kindness, it's a beautiful image. Clothe yourself in kindness. It's such an attractive outfit, <laughs> kindness. Turn to someone and say, you look good in that. <laughs> Come on, guys. I'm either helping you or I'm getting you in trouble, okay? <laughs> you look good in that. What I'm trying to get you to see is that kindness is an outfit that looks good on everyone. It looks good on everyone. And in a world where you can be anything, be kind. That's the challenge today to you and to me. In a world where you can be anything, be kind. Because in some sense, we can be anything in this world today. We can say what we want, do what we want. Certainly on Facebook, we can say what we want. And sometimes we do. King David could have said or done whatever he wanted, and it would have happened. 
He could have had Mephibosheth killed right there and then, taken out the threat to his throne. That's what other kings would have done. That's what we so often like to do, don't we? Take out the threats to our thrones. Kill the thing that threatens us, undermines us, makes us feel insecure. Someone says something nasty about us behind our back and we wanna kinda get back, get revenge. You know, take it out, shut that down. Kill the threat, but the scriptures call us to respond differently. The scriptures call us to be kind, to make allowance for each other's faults, to forgive anyone who offends you. And Paul's assuming we're gonna be offended, but he's calling us to be kind. Now I must say when the preaching team was gathering together a few weeks ago and we were kind of preparing for this series and we really felt like this was a series that God had put in our heart for us as a church, as a congregation in this season. And we really felt like we wanted to anchor this series to three kind of core truths, to core ideas, biblical truths. And, And these truths were kindness, peace and passion. And you'll get to hear that in this series, but I was kind of allocated the kindness topic. And, and, and I must be honest, when I got that, I was like, oh, flip, why me? You know what I mean? I mean, give me peace, give me passion. That's something I can preach about. But kindness, really? I don't feel qualified because to be honest, I don't think I'm a very kind person a lot of the time. I think if you had to ask my wife, or my kids, or my colleagues, I'm not so so sure the answer would be yes. I think I can be quite a hard person. I'm I'm pretty like activistic, get things done, move forward. I can see people sometimes as functions, not relationships, you know, where where are we going? Let's go, come on. Um, I think I would have made a good personal trainer, you know what I mean? Like, come on, you lazy, get your, you know, get moving, stop slacking, you know, come on. Do you even lift, bro? You know, I could pull that off. Um, But sometimes in my relationships at work and even at home, in my zeal to kind of get things done and have, you know, I forget the simple art of being kind, of being kind. So many gods, so many creeds, says Ella Wheeler Wilcox. So many paths that wind and wind while just the art of being kind is all the sad world needs. I came across a fascinating research paper by a guy named John Gottman who runs a, an institute called the Gottman Institute with his wife. And you can Google this stuff, it's, it's fascinating, but I wanna kind of give you the highlights. They're, they're kind of world-renowned researchers when it comes to marital stability and relationship uh, success. And they've now got to a point where they can sit a couple down and just by observing how they interact with one another for like 30 minutes, I think, maybe even less, they can predict to house this, a 94% accuracy level as to whether that couple will still be together in six years' time. I said to Jess, we're not going there. Um, (laughs) But I mean, it's pretty crazy. I mean, these guys in the 90s, they set out to answer the question, why do some marriages work and some don't? And after years of research and observation, their team can now accurately place, just by observing the couples, they place them into two groups, what they call the disasters and the masters, okay? The disasters and the masters. And there's really just one element that separates the disasters from the masters. Any guesses? Kindness. Kindness is the deal breaker, according to the research. Here's how it works, let me explain. Gottman observes couples making what he calls bids. These are like requests for connection. Uh, He says, a bid occurs when one partner in a couple makes a statement about something that they find interesting or meaningful, or maybe it's something they're just casually pointing out. For example, a wife would tell her husband, oh, look at that puppy, he's so adorable, okay? Now she's not just commenting on the puppy, she's actually requesting a response from her husband, some sign of interest or support. It's, It's all about connection. And according to the research, it's how her husband will react to her bid that says whether or not that relationship is healthy. So you can, you can either turn towards a bid or you can turn away from a bid. Now, turning towards, uh, away from the bid would be just kind of like a, oh, that's nice, you know, or, or, or you know, shrug your shoulders or maybe even stop bothering me, you know. It's just kind of a, a negligible or a, ne- or a negative response. Whereas a towards, if you move towards a bid, it's kind of like saying, oh yeah, wow, that is a beautiful dog. He's so playful. Or wow, you know, would you ever like to have a dog like that? You know, that's going over and above. But anyway, um, it's a positive. Clearly the response is more positive. But the key trait is 
that the husband acknowledges his wife in a respectful and constructive manner. He shows his wife that he genuinely cares about what she finds interesting, no matter how trivial the subject may be to him. This is kindness. This is kind. Now, I can see already elbows, you know, like... Um, easy to see in others, not in ourselves. Eh? But let me, let me, after analyzing the data, Got, Gottman found that after those six years, couples who were divorced had turned towards bids only 33% of the time, whereas the couples that remained together turned towards bids 87% of the time. Three out of 10 versus almost nine out of 10, away and towards. He says, he elaborates in an interview, he says this, there's a habit of mind that the masters have, which is this. They are scanning social environment for things they can appreciate and say thank you for. They are building this culture of respect and appreciation very purposefully. Disasters, on the other hand, are scanning the social environment for partner's mistakes. His wife goes on, it's not just scanning the environment, it's scanning the partner for what the partner is doing right or scanning him for what he's doing wrong and criticizing versus respecting him and expressing appreciation. I mean, this is the deal breaker. He goes on to say, when people are so focused on criticizing their partners, they miss 50% of the positive things their partners do. Half, we miss it. And they even begin to see negativity where there is none. Unsurprisingly, this kind of attitude makes partners feel worthless, invisible, unloved, and undervalued. Now, on the other hand, kindness, a little bit of kindness, leads to love, generosity, and deeper friendship. And these findings are not just limited to the Gottman Institute. I mean, more and more research independent from theirs concluding the same thing, and I quote, that kindness is the most important predictor of satisfaction and stability in a relationship. Kindness. Julie Gottman, just to kind of conclude, says this, kindness doesn't mean that we don't express our anger, but the kindness informs how we choose to express that anger. You can throw spears at your partner, or you can explain why you're hurt and angry, and that's the kinder path. No matter how busy or chaotic life gets, don't let kindness and generosity break down. Build it up, strengthen it, and exercise it. You see, kindness is a muscle. It's something that we can exercise, that we can build. Now, when I read all that, I must say, I don't know about you, but I was deeply convicted. I was deeply, deeply challenged. And I remember Jess and I were going through a bit of a rough patch in our marriage when I read this research, and I was really praying at the time. Um, I, was, I was pretty hurt, she was pretty angry, and I remember God speaking to us very clearly through Proverbs 3, verse 3. It says this, never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart, and then you will find favor with both God and people. Then you'll find favor with your wife. That's how I read it. <laughs> yeah. You see, I... God really spoke to me about kindness. He says, tie it around your neck. May it never leave you. It's a way of saying, you know, build it into your life. Build it into who you are, into what you do. And I realized at that time that I'd forgotten in many ways to be kind. We'd, we'd, you know, I'd kind of in that season become so focused on the aspects of Jess's personality that grated me. And, 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 and kind of as the more I focused on her worst, the more I saw of it. And the more I mirrored it back to her by offering her my own worst behavior, that's how it works. And of course, this only magnifies the strain in a relationship. And I realize now, looking back, that the reason she was often behaving the way she was was because she felt unsafe. She felt like I was distancing myself from her, which I, which I was. And the more I saw of that, the more I distanced. And, and, and I think, you see, I think you can actually kill relationships by withholding kindness. And in some ways, that can be the worst kind of punishment. It's, it's in fact a particularly slow and cruel way to hurt someone. And I realize I've been speaking about marriage and that's my context, maybe that's not your context, but I really believe that this applies, this idea of kindness and the power that it has, it applies to every single relationship. Kindness, as I said, is an outfit that looks good on everyone and its ripple effects cross every relationship around you. The power of kindness is not limited to the space between a husband and a wife. It applies to every relationship on the planet, whether that's the irritating person that you work with, 
whether that's your friends, whether that's your boyfriend, whether that's how we relate to our children, how we relate to our parents. And here's what I know. Oftentimes, the person who you find, who we find the hardest to be kind towards, the hardest to love, is usually the person who needs it the most. Who needs it the most. And we have a choice. We can lean in or we can lean away. We can turn towards the bid or we can turn away. In a world where you can be anything, be kind. Be kind. Does that make sense? Guys are very quiet. Making me nervous. Be kind. That's my first application. I just want to give you two applications this evening, real, this morning. Real simple, something that you can take away with you. And the first one is just that. Be kind. Be kind to others. Be kind on Facebook. Be kind in debates. Be kind and gracious in our country, in, in your marriage, to your kids, to your parents. Uh, be kind to the people serving you. You know, the, the guy at the petrol station. Be kind to the beggar on the street. It doesn't mean you have to give money to them every time, but... But be kind, look them in the eye, show them dignity, show them respect, show them that they have value. Be kind to your work colleagues, be kind to the people who get it wrong, to those who make mistakes. Aren't you so glad that God was kind to you when you made mistakes? Be kind even when you don't have to be, in a world where you can be anything, be kind. Look for the good in people instead of scanning for the worst. It's so easy to get our scanners out and find the faults. This was a big one for me. I wrote this down. Understand that sometimes being kind might mean biting your tongue and letting go of always having to be right. Sure. I'm right a lot, so that's a hard one for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Someone once said this, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? <laughs> Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? You see, being right and being righteous aren't always the same thing. In fact, you can be right and be a real idiot about it. Yes? We, you know that? You've seen that? Sometimes Christians can, can be that. And you might be 100% justified in your rightness, but being kind is taking the higher road. David would have been justified. He would have been right to have had Mephibosheth thrown in jail or had him killed in that context, in that culture. But instead... He chose, he chose a higher road. He chose to extend mercy, not to harp on about the past and what Saul had done to him and all this stuff. You see, kindness, I think, we, we think it smacks of softness, but it actually takes much more strength to be kind to our kids, to our partners, to our work colleagues. It's a greater strength. It takes a true king to be kind. And what David was expressing was a deeper demonstration of love that was undeserved, unearned, and unrepayable. This is real strength. Be kind. Now, this is a little bit of a tangent um, on the message today, but just, just go with me for, for a bit. Uh, you'll notice in the scriptures, if you read, Jesus speaks quite a lot about sowing and seeds and planting and harvesting. You notice that? He uses that metaphor quite a lot with his disciples and the people he was teaching. Obviously, that would have made sense to the people of the day, an agricultural community. Um, I know nothing about uh, farming uh, or anything like that, but in, Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus speaks about uh, this idea of planting and, and reaping, and he says we must bring a spade and a sickle. And uh, I thought that was interesting. He kind of gives you this progression of how things grow and what actually needs to take place for things to grow. He says, bring a spade and bring a sickle. Now, the spade was obviously, I take it, used for plowing, uh, used for digging, for planting the seed, and the sickle is used for harvesting, right? Right? Wake up, Oaks, come now, you. Okay, okay. <laughs> but as I was reflecting on that, I realized that you and I live in a world where we want to harvest before we plow. Yes? We want to harvest before we plow. We, want to, we, we, we live in a world that wants to buy it before we can afford it. We live in a world that wants to sleep with it before we put a ring on it. Ooh, I just went there. <laughs> 10.06 in the morning. Okay. But Jesus said, that's not how my kingdom works. In my kingdom, first the spade, then the sickle. Why in the world would you go to a field with a sickle when you didn't plow up the ground with a spade? Why in the world would you expect a fruitful marriage 
or a great sex life for that matter, when you haven't sown seeds of love and intimacy. And you may say, well, what has this got to do with kindness? Well, this for me is the point. For me, kindness is the spade. Kindness is the spade. It's what prepares the soil of all relationships for a bountiful harvest. Yes? And here's something else. Here's something that I've, I've certainly learned, I've seen in our own relationships, in my own marriage, that relationships are highly responsive spaces, okay? And what I mean by that is a little bit of anger, a little bit of you know, mistrust, a little bit of betrayal, uh, it, it can derail a relationship pretty quickly, yes? But on the other side, a little bit of kindness, a little bit of love has the potential to turn things around very, very quickly. It's a responsive space, and that's good news to turn a sour marriage into a loving, intimate one, to turn a battered friendship into a joyful one. And there are stories in this room that I know where God has done exactly that in your relationships, in your marriage. This is the power of kindness, of grace, shown in small waves, ways that make big waves. And so try it, I dare you, be kind. Choose to be kind, this is a choice we make, and see what happens. The second point that I wanna kinda end with around kindness is that I think we're called to pay it forward, to pay it forward. When I was at Varsity, um, in my third year of Varsity, I was living in a digs with four other guys, and we went out to a dinner, um, kind of a celebration at the end of third year, and we, we, I mean, as a student, you know, you don't often go out for dinner, so this was like a big deal. We went out to this nice restaurant. We had starters. We had mains. We had a couple of drinks each. You know, it was, it was really a, a great celebration, and right as we were about to sort of pay the bill at the end, um, this guy, out of nowhere, we didn't know him, an uh, older guy came and said, guys, just want you to know, I've settled your bill. Um, and we were like, wow, that's amazing. You know, you, why? He said, no. He says, when he was at Varsity, he was also at UCT. Uh, when he was at Varsity and he was our age, some guy did the same for him. They, he came and he paid for their meal and it changed, you know, it was so, so, made such an impact that he wanted to do that uh, with his, you know, one day and that he calls us that when we get an opportunity, we could do that. And um, I mean, it was, it was awesome. I mean, we would have ordered a lot more if you'd known, but, um, <laughs> but, but, I mean, it was just such a cool gesture. And, and, and he said something, don't wait for someone to be kind to you before you're kind to them. Don't wait for it. I mean, kindness is best shared. And it's so easy in our relationships to get into this kind of scorecard mentality. You know what I'm talking about, the scorecard? I do this if you do that. I'll risk if you risk. I'll take out the trash if you do that. I, you know, I'll love if you love. I'll give if you give. And all that happens is we water down our relationships to a transaction. I'll do if you do. You know, and it's this give and take. But the reality is relationships are give and give. And when you're both doing that, then no one has to take because we're giving. It's an amazing thing. And so choose to be kind first. It frees you from that. It sets up an environment of grace. Don't wait for someone to be kind to you. Pay it forward. Maybe this week, think of a practical way. Right now where you are, think of a way that you can pay it forward. You can be kind to someone for no reason. Yes? I'm gonna ask the band to come up. Uh, we're gonna close with one last song. And, uh, and as we close, I kinda wanna end with this. I wanna end with this. And th this is my opinion, but in my opinion, we cannot do this without Jesus. We cannot do this without the person of Jesus uh, working in us and through us, through his Holy Spirit. We cannot truly love others. We cannot truly love our spouses. We cannot truly extend kindness to those around us without first realizing and receiving God's love and kindness towards us. I mean, I did, a, I did a word study on kindness as I was preparing for this message, and I was amazed. Almost every time the word kindness appears in the scripture, it's not to describe a person, it's to describe God. That's who he is. It's in his very nature. We sing the song, you're a good, good father, that's who you are, and we're loved by you. That's who we are, that's who I am. He's a kind and merciful God. I said at the very beginning, if you remember, that kindness kills. And that may be confusing now, but what I meant by that is, is that I really believe that if we as a people, if we as a church, as followers of Christ, as children of the kindest king who ever lived, 
I believe if we begin to express kindness in small ways and big ways to those around us, I believe that kindness will kill. It will kill divorce. It will kill pain. It will kill hurt. It will kill guilt and shame. It will kill unforgiveness. It will kill bitterness. I even think it has the, it has the potential to kill uh, bigger things like racism and injustice and poverty as we simply are kind to one another in this country as Christ has been kind to us. Why don't you stand to your feet? As we go back to the story of David and Mephibosheth, you begin to realize that in the story, you can read it, David is a foreshadowing of Jesus. David represents Jesus. What David did for Mephibosheth, God does for us. Just as the king brought the outcast into the palace and made him a son, God adopts us into his family. You and I are Mephibosheth in the story. The similarities between his life and ours are astounding. Before we came into a relationship with the Father, we spent our lives distancing ourselves from him because of our brokenness and shame. We feared that entering his palace his, his, would bring judgment upon his, our heads. But when we finally lay trembling at his feet, he touched us and said, just like David said, do not be afraid. He lifted us up and said, I'm going to give you back everything you've ever lost because of sin. I'm going to give you an inheritance, blessings, and riches in the heavenly places. But more than that, I want you forever in my presence, eating at my table. And I will call you son. And I will call you daughter. Son, daughter of the king, the kindest king who ever lived. Let's sing together. facing a giant that you just can't seem to get your head around. Maybe there's relational stuff going on in your life that you just need prayer for. We would love to pray for you. Please don't leave this place without coming forward after the service and having someone, one of our team would love to pray with you. And maybe it's got nothing to do with what we heard today, but you just need prayer. Please don't miss this opportunity to, have, to, to meet with someone and to pray together. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for what you have done so that we might be free. Lord, we thank you that you, by your stripes we are healed. It's not just a personal thing, it's a relational thing that because of what you have done for us, we can now have whole relationships, healthy relationships, reconciled relationships. Lord, I pray for every single person here who maybe right now is kind of struggling in a relationship. Maybe, uh, maybe it's a friend or a family member or a partner, whatever that looks like, Lord. You know that situation. And we believe that you are a God who seeks to bring reconciliation, healing and wholeness, forgiveness and hope. And so we just ask for your hope now to flood our hearts. Help us 
to extend grace and kindness towards one another as you have extended grace and kindness towards us. If we've got stuck in a give and take, help us to give and give just as you have given to us. And that would truly transform and change our lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much. Don't miss next week. We'll see you next time. Call me by name, raise me to love.